Welcome to uh, our 17th annual Chesterton Conference, which is kind of an unbelievable event. Um, this conference uh, it has our previous conferences. It's a, it's a gift of the Bazillion Fathers of Rochester. Uh, you know, I, I, some of you know the story. I mean, the campus, you know, we normally would, would be at, at, at St. John Fisher College campus, and they, they, they got all crazy about uh, rules and requirements of masks and inoculation, and they, they weren't having any outside groups uh, come to, to use campus space at all. Uh, the Bazillion Fathers recognized this. We said, well, if we could find a facility, would you fund us? And they said, yes. So you take the blessings <laughs> that you can get. You know? their, their greatest gift to us, the Bazillion Fathers, uh, was the saintly priest who was our joint founder. Uh, for many years, our, uh, our mentor and guide through the literary work of G.K. Chesterton and uh, in grateful recognition, we've renamed this series of conferences in his honor, uh, and that's, of course, Father Leo Hetzler, CSB. Uh, he was a teacher and a lover of literature, and, and you know, I would surely have enjoyed the sight of all these faces at, at a conference on poetry. You know, this is a, this is actually a huge subject. You know, you just, if you think about it, I mean, they're just they're, we can only talk about just certain very limited aspects of poetry. I mean, we we this is a gigantic subject, um, but it's really an important part of our Christian legacy, and I uh, I think you will find that shown true in, in, in what we say today. The, the subtitle of this conference is Fruit of Christian Joy. And, and I think for some people who are associated with poetry that, that might startle them or whatever, it's unarguably clear that the best of poetry is, is part of our Christian tradition. As Christians, the best of poetry happens to be pronouncedly and unequivocally ours. This doesn't mean that all the great poets were Catholic themselves. Uh, our tradition includes the, the Psalms of David, the Song of Songs, uh, um, uh, ascribed to Solomon and others. And as to the pagan poets, as G.K. Chesterton observes, it is only Christian men guard even heathen things. And the other part, Christian joy, uh, uh, you have to be the judge of that. Uh, if you listen to these speakers, catch the atmosphere, hang around this conference today, and you don't get an inkling of Christian joy, oh. you know, I can't finish that sentence. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Uh, you came to the wrong conference. Um, but uh, I think you know what I mean. So uh, let us fear forward. I'm going to tell a little story, and um, not just yet. Okay, uh, we, we went to the Adirondacks recently, and uh, visiting visiting with someone, and, and of course there's a, you know, because we're there, there's a huge electrical storm, all the power goes out, and, and in the particular place we were staying, that meant not only wasn't water coming in, but there wasn't water going out. <laughs> I don't need to be more graphic than that, but you, you can picture the situation that, that you're in out there in the woods. So it sounded like a good morning to go uh, for a day trip. So we took off uh, somewhere, and it's somewhere in the Adirondacks, and I, I could never find it, but it's a wonderful place, a nature lover's wonderland called the Wild Center. As its name implies, I mean, the Wild Center, it, it, it's, it's this collection of trails and exhibits, all the local flora and fauna, uh, you know, the grounds are studded with all these trees and wildflowers, and even the poison ivy is labeled, you know, so you, can, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, so you can really appreciate nature and know what, you, what you're looking at. Um, 
observation post, hanging bridges, and, and, and there's an exhibit hall at the Wild Center. And that's kind of the crown jewel of the place. And then you can see all kinds of reptiles that you kind of, and, and other things you kind of don't want to see crawling around the woods, but are nice behind, behind the glass. And, uh, you know, like little otters, cute little otters swimming around and that, that look cute swimming around only to a farmer who has a f small fish pond. They're, they're an absolute rodent. <laughs> um, yeah, but they're cute when they're objectively speaking. Um, you know, I like mushrooms and what kind of mushrooms you can find and spiders and, and, and all, you know, really beautiful. I mean, it, it really is a, it's a lot of fun. And I, I, I'm not at all knocking that. The Wild Center, I'm a fan of it, the Wild Center. Um, but something very interesting happened, and that leads into slide one. Just inside the entrance to the Wild Center is a, a hanging poster, a ban banner, you know, with a few lines of poetry, and this thus it reads, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Uh, anybody know who's the poet? <laughs> Elliot. Who said Elliot? That's good. What poem? Uh, one of the four quartets. You got it. In fact, it's from the very end of the fourth quartet. No, somebody at the Wild Center searched about and found those lines and thought them very apt for what they do at the Wild Center and, uh, you know, appropriate for the entry to a, to a living museum with a lot of snakes and fish and poisonous and deadly mushrooms and all kinds of things. It seemed fitting to them, probably, to select from arguably the, the poet who was considered the paramount modernist poet of the 20th century, T.S. Eliot. And it's from uh, one of his later poems in his career, um, The Four Quartets. In 1922, let's, oh, I can do this now. That's probably Eliot more toward 1922. He rocked the poetic world with his masterpiece, The Wasteland, um, which was loved by the modernist poets and loathed by the traditionalists as utter garbage. Okay. Um, the poem, like most of Eliot, is quite curious. But it made a name for T.S. Eliot, and he became the idol, as it were, the poster child of, of, of the modernist movement in poetry. To those who lauded it, it was avant-garde, it was a, a beacon of, of modern materialism, futility, spiritual failure, disillusionment, and despair. I, you know, that, that sort of gives you an idea of what they, what they wanted and what they liked about it, what they thought they saw in it. So in the secular world, he, you know, he had this reputation, and it's actually in a funny way, he's kind of retained this reputation, too. People don't know about T.S. Eliot. In June 1927, okay, so that's 1922. This is the young Eliot, right, supposedly. Okay, uh, 1927, Eliot not only renounces his, his uh, American citizenship and becomes English, but he converts to Christianity and becomes an Anglo-Catholic. Now, this is... You know, this is like a high Anglican Catholicism. It's as close as you can come to Rome, you know, without without being there. Formal, in, in terms of form, anyway. Um, you know, um, he, he wanted to be very English, but but the point is, he was very Christian and very committed. Um, this shocked the literary world. Uh, uh, it, it, it was it was like the same people that were lauding and praising him for the wasteland were, were saying, "Oh my goodness, how how could how could he do this?" I got uh, let's see, this that's the older Elliot. That's just kind of fun. But this is what Virginia Woolf said when she found out that um, 
he had converted to Christianity. Dear Tom Elliott, who may be called dead to us all today, from this day forward, he has become an Anglo-Catholic believer in God and immortality and goes to church. There's something obscene in a living person sitting by the fire and believing in God. Uh, you know, that's, she later took her life and said testament to her own beliefs. But that just reminds, reminds you know, of Chesterton's line, you know, perhaps um, they might not be the very best judges of the relation of religion to happiness, who by their own account had neither one nor the other. <laughs> thus, thus Virginia Woolf. The four quartets, okay, so this is 21 years late after uh, The Wasteland, is the poem. Uh, that's exerted on that poster at the Wild Center. Um, the structure of that poem is really very interesting. It's a very different poem from The Wasteland, and yet there are these Eli Eliotean elements in it that, uh, that let you know that he wrote it. It's really interesting to see a quick look at some of the sources and echoes of that in that poem that are not really apparent to the secular reader, but they're distinctly there. Ideas and concepts and images from St. Anthony of the Desert, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Augustine, Dame Julian of Norwich, and Dante, the greatest Christian poet. There's phrasing in it that's directly traceable to Genesis, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and St. Luke. And there are explicit and intentional references to Christian mysteries, the Incarnation, the Annunciation, which interestingly enough, he, when he talks in, in one of the quartets about Annunciation, he starts it off with the small letter A, but by the end he's using the, the capital A, and the word, which he also plays the same verbal trick with. Um, this is all in the poem. Very, a very difficult poem, a very difficult poem to read, but it's all palpably there, and it can be pointed out to you. Um, it is a very Christian poem. Uh, just to kind of almost race through the structure of it is very interesting. The first quartet, Bernd Norton, he has great lines, like, humankind cannot bear very much reality. And, and, and I mean, that echoes with, with certainly with, with C.S. Lewis and other writers. A key point, a key point, of Eliot's and something he, he'll, he'll return to and something he'll really emphasize is the still point, the still, at the still point of the turning world. The still point, you got a picture, is a wheel, and, and a, you know, okay, it's a wheel and it's got a radius and the stuff on the radius is moving around really fast and the stuff, as you get closer to the still point, it's not moving so fast. And you get to the still point, the still point is right at the middle, the geometric, geometric exact center, which is an idealization, okay, but, it's the only way you can do physics anyway. Um, at the still point, there is no movement. And this is something that, that Eliot, an idea that he had been trying to approach for years the, in different ways, and it shows up in, in other poems of his, that his, 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 how to express the still point. The still point, that's really contemplation of God. The first quartet, basically, has the strongest hints and discussion of God the Father. The second quartet has a very interesting image in it. The wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Beneath the bleeding hands we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art. Now, like, wait a minute, the wounded surgeon? What is this wounded surgeon? Who is the wounded surgeon? Who has the bleeding hands that heal? Certainly, it's Christ, the Son. The third quartet is, uh, um, he, he talks about much about the sea, and, and he has a line, Lady whose shrine stands on the promontory, pray for those who are in ships. And quotes Dante, Filia del tuo filio, and says Queen of Heaven, and Filia del Quo Filio is the only Italian I really know other than street stuff. 
daughter of your son from Dante. Did I get that right? I get these relationships wrong. The fourth, so the third quartet obviously is about the Blessed Mother and the fourth quartet who then divides the torment against the background of World War II, dive bombings and, and all kinds of horrible things and, and he, Elliot himself during World War II was a fire warden in his area in, in London. Earth, air, fire and water are these, are these elements that he contrasts with the Christian view and, and, and with the Christian God and who then divides the torment, love, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So in the four quartets, he's really got a lot that's intensely passionate, spiritual, unabashedly Christian, and um, yet very, very obscure, very difficult to poke your way through and, and figure out. Uh, like the sea uh, in Eliot's poem, it tosses up its losses indiscriminately. I'm in the poem. To understand this poem or any other great poetry is is not an easy task. Um, you know, it's, it's it's very deeply personal. It's intentionally obscure. Almost playing almost playing the same game with you that Evelyn and Paul will, will play in Bright's Head for Visited. Just just getting it past the secular world, so they think it's one thing, but it's quite another. Or Flannery O'Connor showing you the horror of something and then the, the secular world gets rid of what she would call the wrong horror. <laughs> so it's the spiritual horror that, that she wanted to emphasize. Great literature, great art, great music derives directly from the Christian tradition. It is ours. How ungrateful we are if we ignore the gifts of Christian culture. How much we lose if we ignore them and if we fail to pass them on. <laughs> With respect to the wild center, okay, in the Heraclean sense, the center was the center of flux and, and all this is, is, is chaos and movement and that's, that's the center to, to Heraclitus and, and the Greeks uh, until Aristotle where the unmoved mover has to stand apart from that. But with respect to what they had, it, it, I, I admire their taste but I don't think they probably understand it. That Those lines are about, you know, we'll never cease from exploring whatever. It, it isn't about they're not about searching the wood for mushrooms and, 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 and taking a look at plants and birds and stuff. Uh, or speckled trout and all this stuff. Uh, it's an altogether different type of ex exploration that T.S. Eliot is talking about. So, in, in, in a sort of a, a, a pun of a way, Eliot is not about the wild center. He's about the still point. Chesterton observes that Great poets are obscure for two opposite reasons. <clears throat> now, because they're talking about something too large for anyone to understand. And now again, because they're talking about something too small for anyone to see. And he talks about the, the two different kind of infinities that, you know, mathematicians know about. Um, you know, so immense that you can't comprehend it, so small that you can't comprehend it. To pierce through the obscurity, you know, it, it helps to have a guide when you're reading, when you're doing some poetry, and, and, and for for dub descent, uh, for T.S. Eliot's four quartets, it happens to be Tom Howard's dub descending, but he's certainly not the only one, but he's probably the best, and Tom Howard spoke at our sixth conference back in whatever that was. And uh, he is he is since deceased, um, but he was a, he was a great teacher and a great lecturer, and we, we remember him fondly. Um, 
one needs a guide to, L, to T.S. Eliot, that's for sure. But it's in the same spirit of, of maybe uh, leading you to appreciate poetry through some obscurity that's almost a necessary part of the art. Um, it's in the same spirit that we're offering you today four guides to, to, uh, to poetry from the Christian perspective that should give you some insight in, in how to appreciate this great uh, gift of poetry. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I needed to say. Thank you. <laughs>